Good morning, Mr. Armkey back with you today for your uh, SEC 110 lecture series. So we are working from the CompTIA Security Plus Guide to Network Security Fundamentals 6th edition. Um, chapter 1 is all about the introduction to security. So we've got our four primary objectives. We're going to describe the challenges of securing information, of course defining information security and why it's important. Uh, we're going to talk about some different types of attackers that are common today and the five basic principles of defense. Securing information is, there, there's no magic bullet. There's no one thing that fixes everything. Uh, what we have to do instead is take a multi-layered and multi-pronged approach to ensure that the systems we are attempting to secure are protected at multiple points as well as with multiple methods. Um, defending against attacks can be very difficult because they come at us in a variety of forms. That's really the one that's the biggest problem now is that with botnets being as they are and the interconnectedness of systems, there are so many different avenues that attackers can use to try and take advantage of the um, highly connected nature of our world. You know, there was a, a breach in a Las Vegas casino because somebody was able to breach the firmware for a, uh, a fish tank control um, like the you know salinity ph and uh, aeration you know they were able to get into one of those uh, custom controller systems and use that to pivot into uh, the rest of the casino's network pivoting is a term that you'll hear quite a bit basically it means that we take advantage of a weaker system that is connected to a larger more valuable system so some different attacks from the headlines, um, remote control cars. I've got some details on the next slide about that one. That is one I want to get uh, a bit more detail on because that is one I get asked about a lot. Uh, tampering with aircraft systems, the Yahoo breach. The Yahoo breach, for, don't, yeah, for those of you who don't know, um, <clears throat> is between, I want to say it was around 2014 to 2016. Yahoo originally claimed that there was like a 500 million user breach that ended up becoming one and a half billion and eventually three billion by the time it was all flushed out. And this was while uh, they were going through sales proceedings uh, to be sold to Verizon. So it was very, very negative for Yahoo overall, not to mention the fact that it was a massive breach of security. Um, the thing that I always tell people about is, you know, even if you weren't necessarily affected by a breach, it gives hackers a lot of leverage because now they're attacking people who may be connected to you. Or if you compromised an email that you haven't used in several years, it may contain the necessary information for them to build a profile so that they could um, use social engineering or um, add some useful uh, salting techniques to their password breaches uh, or rainbow tables to try and break your existing passwords. And all of this can be automated fairly well. USB drive malware, or the USB killer, um, Something we have to remember is that USB drives, more often than not, use what's called a generic mass storage driver when they first load. So this means that um, as they connect to the system, they can sometimes uh, gain access that would be a little bit more difficult in certain cases, or they may be able to deliver uh, very simplified payloads. USB drives, uh, such as the rubber duck, which you may have heard of, can identify themselves as something like a keyboard, uh, and keyboards and mice do not undergo driver signing the same way that other peripherals do, and thus can um, override some of the security protocols we might otherwise deal with. Uh, WinVote, this was a type of voting machine that was involved, um, and there was some serious tampering that went on with those, um, that they were able to show how quickly you could cause uh, one of those systems to be compromised, um, provided that you had just a little bit of time and access to the, uh, the internal SD card slot. VTech, um, this was a breach that occurred where um, children's tablets, these little leapfrog VTech tablets, um, had an account attached to them. That account would be attached to a payment method, usually through uh, some kind of subscription. So that would mean that when the database was breached, there were compromised information pieces about children. There were photographs of those children, um, usually their birthdays, because the tablet would use that to be like, happy birthday when you logged in on the day of. It would also give them uh, payment information and uh, other demographic information about whoever was maintaining the subscription. So it could be their parents, could be their grandparents. Um, so then you can start building a profile. And in the age of, you know, 
uh, modern internet doxing, it's pretty easy to start building a, a pretty strong profile that you could use to track someone. Um, so somebody who had malicious intent in mind could very easily um, carry out some very nasty things using uh, an information breach of that size. The European Space Agency, um, of course, whenever we have state systems or, or nationally recognized systems in our country or in others, we always get very nervous because of the interconnected nature of the, uh, the databases in question. Who reports to whom, um, who has access to databases from other, um, sometimes either state or private agencies that are very, very important, um, different types of payroll, um, things that could expose national security issues. So that's always part of the problem. IRS fraud, um, still, even now, um, it's been 10 years since it first started becoming much more prevalent in the digital age with everybody filing their taxes online. Um, lots of people who are reporting um, for tax returns who are actually deceased. Um, happens quite a bit. Uh, and then, of course, you know, for children or, or, you know, the disabled or others who may not file a return under normal circumstances. Uh, and then Hyatt Hotels. They had a pretty uh, heavy breach. You got to remember, hotels have access to a lot of different pieces of information because they have a registry of people who are uh, staying with them. So you can track movements. You have rewards programs that people can uh, fraudulently manipulate. You have credit card information. You know, if you have somebody who's traveling on a corporate account, that card uh, may not be monitored as closely, especially if it's a higher end company. Maybe there's a threshold at which they just don't question certain purchases. Um, so breaches of that kind are not good. Um, higher end hotels who experience a breach like this, you know, I'm mean, not to say that Hyatt is low end in any capacity, um, but you know, if you had something like the Ritz Carlton uh, or Waldorf Astoria, those would obviously probably have a much higher end clientele that would. Um, probably not like their movements to be recorded, um, you know, if they're trying to, you know, stay out of paparazzi tracking and things like that. So um, anytime an agency of that kind of caliber is breached, we always have to be very cautious because there's a lot of information that we don't initially think about. So as I said, I wanted to get into car hacking a little bit because it is something that I do get asked about. Um, it's not quite as bad as sci-fi would have you think. Uh, to where you have a system that allows you to, you know, basically take control of somebody's wheel and, you know, and all of this stuff. But there are some changes that you can deal with, uh, like the TPMS. You can basically make sure that um, normally this system would provide warnings if your tire pressure was too high or too low. And hackers could then uh, use this system to actually track uh, where you are because the, uh, the TPMS can sometimes be interconnected with things like your GPS. Um, you can also trigger warning lights to try and cause somebody to stop off. So let's say that if you have some of these systems to where you could uh, track somebody's location, you could cause them to have a warning light trigger when they're close to a shop um, that you, know, you as a, a criminal element or a negative uh, malicious element would have access to uh, to try and gain physical access to a vehicle while it's getting checked out. Disabling the brakes. This is one that always makes people really nervous. So you control the pedal, right? You press down the brake pedal. The brake pedal then is able to apply pressure to a hydraulic cylinder, and the cylinder then is able to press down, um, in, in basic terms, on the on the discs and or not the discs um, on the calipers on your brakes uh, to clamp down on the brake disc in order to make it um, lose inertia. It's trying to slow it down with friction. So under a normal system where you have a completely standalone hydraulic system that wouldn't be an issue but now in order to make brakes more efficient in order to enhance anti-lock brake systems um, limited slip differentials all of these different things that we do to try to make sure that a car stays safe in an environment where it may have difficulty gaining traction or if it's um, trying to regain control after uh, an incident of you know fishtailing or things like that there are microprocessors that are able to respond much more rapidly and much more consistently than a human being. So your ECM or electronic control module actually determines what happens with your brakes. Now, automatic braking can be applied in certain circumstances, things like that. Um, if your, EC, if your <clears throat> excuse me, if your ECM gets breached, 
your brakes could be disabled entirely, which would make it very difficult for you to try and uh, to stop if you needed to. Now, thankfully, um, you can do things like if you're in a manual transmission, try and downshift. Uh, obviously, the increased friction on the gearbox will try and slow your um, your systems. Um, there, there's a couple of things you can do. You can try throwing the e-brake. The e-brake might be a little bit different depending on whether or not it's already interconnected uh, with the rest of your ECM. In certain cases, your ECM, if breached, excuse me, your ECM, if it is breached, could stop your engine. So if you have a situation um, like I do with my car, I have remote um, remote ignition, so I can use my key fob to turn over the engine so that when I get into the car, if it's a hot day, I can go ahead and have the AC move and get some air going, um, which is great. It's a very comfortable thing. But this means that um, somebody could theoretically turn my engine off, or they could have a situation where um, the engine starts where I'm nowhere near the vehicle, and it will just run and run and run and run and run, uh, trying to run down fuel, run down battery, things like that. Um, you know, there's a number of different reasons why they might want to do that. Diagnostic fraud. Um, repair shops and dealers rely on uh, onboard diagnostics, usually abbreviated as OBD. So if you see like OBD-II, that's OBD2. Uh, that's a type of onboard interface port, usually just under your dashboard, that you can use to talk to your car's ECM and try and establish where a particular problem may be originating. Now, unscrupulous shops can say, oh, well, you know, we're seeing a problem with one of your O2 sensors or we're seeing an issue with your, um, you know, there's all kinds of different problems. You know, your, your master cylinder is showing an error, things like that. So this could basically say, you know, we can't physically see any damage, but your ECM is showing a problem. So at that point, they could either say, well, we can try and work on the, you know, brakes or whatever it is that's a problem, or we can replace your ECM. ECM in most cars is going to be an $1,100 to $1,500 charge. If there's nothing wrong with your ECM, they then will take the ECM that they took out of your car, put in the new one, uh, and then save the other one for, you know, selling it to somebody else. They clean it up, and they make it look as if it's uh, brand new, and then they sell it for the same amount, having uh, fraudulently pulled it out of your vehicle. So, you know, it's just a, it's a money pump for people who are um, extremely unethical. Changing the time, radio, or GPS on your machine. Once they breach your ECM, um, there's a lot of different pivots they could make. They can make very small changes, but they are uh, very important changes. So, you know, even psychologically, it can be very unnerving for your radio station to start switching on its own. Or if you have your GPS on, and you're in an unfamiliar area, you could get sent to a destination where basically there are people waiting for you to, um, you know, kidnap you or steal your stuff or steal your car. Not something you'd necessarily want to uh, uh, experience, I'm sure. So something as simple as that can be very dangerous. Now this does require that your um, your GPS and stuff be on board. You know, it's basically built into your systems of your car. Um, if you're using your onboard GPS and you're kind of confused about where it's sending you, you can always corroborate by using like your phone's GPS or something similar. This is of course assuming that there's no breach on your phone as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. MP3 malware. This is one that kind of wigged me out when I first heard about it because I used to use a USB flash drive um, as an MP3 player a um, long, long time ago. And the music on your stereo could hack your vehicle. So if you have what's called an infotainment cluster, um, this is where all of your primary control interfaces that would normally be switches and little lights on your dashboard can be sent to a um, you know, touch screen or a button screen. Um, my dad's car had one years and years ago when he had his Lexus. Um, I've seen them in, you know, Dodges that are like mine. I've seen, you know, a number of different cars that have these little touchscreen clusters that allow you to see uh, what music you're listening to, what are the outside temperatures, you know, it, it gives you an integrated feel, kind of like your smartphone. Um, but that infotainment cluster is going to contain a number of different interconnected systems that it's able to speak to. So that means that your engine or brake controls could be um, activated because it manipulates the, you know, um, cruise control that would be in your, your ECM as attached to the infotainment cluster. Forced acceleration. This one I've, I've not seen, but I've heard examples of. Power locks often have features like auto locking when a car is put into gear or reaches a certain speed. So if you put a car into drive or if you accelerate over, usually it's 15 to 20 miles an hour, the doors will automatically lock themselves. There is another issue to where 
uh, let's say that you were in an accident, you know, unfortunately, and your airbags deployed. Well, if you're unconscious, they don't want to have to break your window to get into you to get you out, right? Whenever law enforcement arrives or uh, first responders in general. So if your airbags are deployed in certain circumstances, the power locks may disengage, which means that your vehicle is then able to be opened easily. They can get you out without um, causing so much damage. But if these systems are interconnected, as I was talking about before, this means that they are then vulnerable to hackers to where people could get into, you know, forcing the um, acceleration system through cruise control or forcing the braking system, messing with the, um, um, limited slip again for your differential you know uh, traction controls those can be adjusted so it's important to understand that you know it's it's great when we update cars to have all of these uh, advanced technological features but we have a problem that originates when the control systems for these objects are not secured they don't have the same code signing or other items that are necessary to make sure that uh, our pcs you know, our, our desktops, laptops, and mobile devices are, are also secure. With car hacking, I also want to discuss the extended uh, key fob. So essentially the idea is that your key fob produces a radio frequency signal when you press a particular button, it sends out these impulses in, in radio frequency. And there can be a, a transceiver or a receiver that will capture that information depending on uh, what they're using. So either they can try and intercept it separately or they can try and receive it and then pass it on to your vehicle. Um, that can sometimes be helpful for them to identify which key fob belongs to which vehicle in case they didn't see which one you got out of. Um, once that transmitted signal has been copied, they can then use that to unlock your vehicle. They can use it to try and capture things like remote ignition or whatever else and try and uh, break it and hotwire your car, stuff like that. Driving data downloads, lots of vehicles, especially if they have onboard telematics, will record your driving data, keep track of where you are and where you're going um, so that they can optimize your route, things like that. If it is hacked, this could be used to exploit your privacy, discover where you live, where you work. If you have children, it could be where you uh, take them to school. It could be where your doctor's office is, uh, things of that nature. Smartphone access, uh, hackers may be less interested in your vehicle. So if you have a phone that's connected to your vehicle, they could possibly download information from your um, your phone book. They can connect via Bluetooth and cause different types of file transfers to occur, which could compromise your phone and give them access to credit card access, um, uh, credit card information rather, passwords, financial data, all kinds of different things. So if your vehicle is compromised, your phone may also be at risk. AC inversion. This is a particularly nasty one because I've seen what happens to cars like this. If you live somewhere extremely hot or extremely cold, so say you live in, you know, Phoenix, Arizona, or if you live in, you know, Anchorage, Alaska, um, you know, relatively well-maintained places, but still very susceptible to extremes of temperature. You know, you go out to, you know, Vegas and temperatures are like 120 degrees or something crazy. Air conditioning systems are about safety because if you're driving around in a little metal box in 120 degree weather, eventually it treats it like an oven. It just bakes you, right? So... AC is all about keeping you cool and keeping your car from becoming susceptible to certain types of damage. They're also vulnerable to hacking, just like anything else. Now, in the summer, um, a hacker could have a system sitting out in, you know, 110 to 120 degree heat and then kick on the hot air as well as the seat warmers. And this could cause pretty major damage. In certain cases, it could actually cause certain, you know, hoses and connections to weaken or break, which could then release um, very unpleasant fluids, you know, from your... Uh, transmission or from your um, from your oil if you're you know crankcase things like that different parts of the engine different gaskets could break could cause cracks in your radiator uh, some really gnarly stuff um, thankfully of course you know most of the time you know things like aluminum you have to be heated up to about 12 to 1500 degrees in order to breach in that way but if you do it over time uh, or if you have a system that is slightly older um, it could already be you know, kind of weakened as is and could cause some pretty serious issues. Um, the weather stripping on your car door could start to peel off, which could make it more susceptible to somebody trying to crowbar the door open, things like that. The windshield wiper control. This is one that I was aware of, but I didn't think about it being as particularly dangerous until I, I looked in it a little bit more. Windshield cleaning fluid is useful, but when it's unexpectedly released or continuously released, it can be a very high danger to your visibility. Now, Along with the wipers themselves, this system can be hacked. 
Um, I've seen things about people putting, um, you know, uh, different types of fluid in the windshield cleaning fluid in order to make it uh, more flammable and make it more damaging to uh, an internal system. Uh, I've seen people replace the um, windshield wiper blades with ones that have been coated with uh, with sand in order to scratch the windshield and, and damage visibility even further. Really, really heinous stuff. Um, and of course, you know, possibly uh, causing harm, which would be a pretty pretty serious um, charge if you were to be caught by law enforcement. So uh, hackers are, are getting very, very bold about this kind of thing. So why are these attacks successful? Well, we have a lot of widespread vulnerabilities. We have configuration issues. Software, unfortunately, because we tend to rely a lot more on open source stuff now because of cost, um, tends to mean that we end up with stuff that hasn't gone through the same level of quality testing. So it's, it's not necessarily that it's poorly designed. Um, it's that it's, it's poorly tested in a lot of cases. Now, poorly designed software does exist, but um, it's not as prevalent as stuff that just hasn't been put through the ringer of, of quality assurance. Hardware limitations, of course, um, that can always be problematic. You know, if you have systems that are uh, still running Windows, you know, 95, 98 XP versus ones that are running 8.1 or Windows 10, um, you know, there's a certain level of, of accepted balance in the hardware. You know, there's a certain amount of RAM um, that we expect to see in a Windows 10 system that would not be possible in a Windows 98 system. Enterprise-based issues, uh, of course, whenever we look at enterprise-based operating systems, we know that there's a big difference in how data um, is, is, is husbanded, you know, how we control uh, group policy access, how we control um, different types of resource facilitation. All of those things are going to be controlled in a very different way to a standard uh, workstation system, uh, what we call a monolith. Um, those are in a standalone system. They don't really have the same centralized controls. So this means that there are certain types of updates that mean that if you can breach the central domain controller, then you automatically have access to uh, items inside of that domain. Now, there are ways to prevent against that, but they are a bit more vigorous than a lot of companies like to invest in. Then here we have a table that talks about difficulties in defending against attacks. Now, I'm obviously not going to um, insult you by sitting here and reading all of this out, but it's it's 10 really good reasons why we see problems. So if you want to just pause it here, uh, take a look at these notes, kind of familiarize yourself with that. Uh, most of them seem to be interrelated if you look at it. You know, it, it, there's more devices that are connected. Things are faster. Um, there's more sophistication in the attacks, and that can be done in an automated way. So if you look at number four, the availability and simplicity of attack tools means that we can write an attack tool as a uh, highly skilled computer um, intruder or attacker and be able to reproduce that by means of a script. We can then sell that script to others and make ourselves less likely to be caught by basically passing stuff on. Um, you know, kind of how you, it's like, you know, you can't blame a gun manufacturer for somebody getting shot, right? And then we can see that because we have so many different devices out there and so many different operating systems, it's difficult to create updates. You know, there's a difficulty in distributing these updates in a timely manner, making sure that everybody's covered. Um, and then, of course, personal devices in an enterprise environment, that can be a problem. And the last one I do want to point out is user confusion. And this is where users are required to make difficult decisions with little or no instruction. And everybody has uh, this involvement and something, you know, I'll hear it referred to as the uh, Aunt Tilly or Uncle Billy test. And the idea is, is that you have a relative that's of a different generation, didn't grow up with these, uh, these pieces of electronics, and they don't understand some of the vulnerabilities that are actually out there. Or in some cases, because they don't understand, they are um, much more prone to making snap judgments without sound backing, which means they may leave themselves more vulnerable than if they had just left well enough alone. So information security is the crux of what we do in this class and in this major. So before we can impose defense in any capacity, we have to understand what security is, how information security relates to security in general, and some terminology. Um, I'm, I'm big on making sure that we use the correct vocabulary for things, being able to talk to one another in an effective manner, being able to say, you know, this is this and this is this, being able to separate things. Uh, I always tell this story in face-to-face in, in -face lectures about how I've had clients 
Uh, one client in particular that stands out that everything was the server. You know, monitor was unplugged, it allowed servers down. Um, you know, he can't hear anything because his audio cable got disconnected or he accidentally muted something. Well, it's the server, something's obviously wrong. And I understand the motivation to sound like you know what you're talking about because a lot of people are worried that if you're completely uh, without knowledge in a particular environment, then you're worried that people may try and take advantage of you. And that, that is, you know, that's a worry that occurs uh, not without merit in several different industries, but that is why we as information security technicians must always maintain high levels of ethical standards. Security is the freedom from danger. That's the goal, right? We wanna make sure that we are removing potential for risk, the likelihood that something bad will happen. Security is a process that achieves this freedom. But as we know, there's no such thing as perfect security or perfect freedom. And the tool that we often use to kind of understand this is there's a balance that must be struck and there is an inversely proportional relationship that we will experience. As security increases, convenience will often decrease. So the more secure something is, the less convenient it may become to use. And the, the, it says may become, it almost always is. Now we have to be careful about assigning a two-way street on this. This does not mean that as something becomes less convenient, it becomes more secure. Something can be very poorly designed and be absolutely insecure. So what we wanna make sure of is we're only looking at it in one direction, increase of security, decrease of convenience. So information security is the task of securing information in a digital format. So we're dealing with stuff that is going to be uh, manipulated, transmitted, or preserved. So we're talking about something that's in the CPU, on RAM, on an optical disk, on a hard drive, or being transmitted over a network, be it wired or wireless. The goal of information security is to ensure that protective measures are implemented that allow us to ward off attacks and prevent the total collapse of the system when an attack occurs. So we have to pay attention to this one here. Not only are we trying to make sure that we have a strong defense, but we also have to make sure that just in case something goes wrong, we still have the ability to prevent the system from falling apart completely. We can isolate or otherwise uh, cut off the system that is affected and be able to maintain business as usual in as much as it is possible on the other side. So it's kind of like your body. Uh, you know, if you got a splinter in your foot, you don't want all of a sudden to go blind, right? You don't want all of your systems to start shutting down because of an injury in one location. You want these things to be centralized, compartmentalized, if you will. The triad of information protection, often called CIA, is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, what these three things mean are confidentiality. To keep confidential means that only people who are approved for access to a particular piece of information may gain that access. Integrity means that the information is as it was originally purported to be. It's correct, it's unaltered. And availability means that information is accessible only to authorized users, um, allowing people access to things that they should see and preventing access to things that they should not see. And you can see how those three things would be interrelated to help prevent uh, unauthorized access. You can see kind of this layered structure approach here to where we have the CIA uh, in the middle protecting the information at its core. Then we deal with the three primary methods uh, or vehicles for data. And then we have people, products, and then policies and procedures, which are the layers that we use to protect that data when it starts interacting with physical objects or individuals. So the products are the physical security around the data. Uh, this could be stuff like you know, network security equipment. This could even be software that's involved with that security equipment, door locks, cameras, you know, switches, routers, all that stuff. The people or personnel are those who implement and use those security products. And then policies and procedures help to govern correct usage of the products uh, by the individuals. So we make sure that company-wide, everybody knows how to respond to, if I find a door open in a secure area, do I report it? Do I close it myself? You know, there's, there's rules that have to be in place for these things. Um, and again, it, it's these weird triads that we form. We have, you know, the data protection stuff with the CIA triad. We know we're dealing with transmission, storage, and manipulation. And then of course we have uh, products, personnel, and policies in order to govern how these things behave in a physical environment. Some terminology that we need. An asset that has value 
or an item that has value rather is called an asset. So, um, you know, assets can be tangible or non-tangible. Um, I'm, not, I'm not talking about NFTs. I'm talking about, you know, useful data and like financial information, or it could be, you know, grabbing somebody's checkbook. Uh, a threat is a type of action that has the potential to cause harm. A threat actor is a person or element with the power to carry out that threat. Uh, now here on the right hand side of the screen, we can see kind of a little clip art graphic structure. Helps us to illustrate um, information security components. So we have a scooter, which is an asset. The risk that is likely to occur to that scooter is that it could be stolen. That is a threat. So we have the theft of the scooter is a threat. The carried out threat becomes a risk. The threat actor is the vector for carrying this out. Um, that's, the, that's the bringer of the potential risk. And then we have an attack vector over here on the left. Um, there's a hole in the fence, which is our vulnerability. And if the thief goes through the hole, they could then steal the scooter. So we are providing um, an individual who will carry out the attack, a method by which that attack may be uh, successful. And then we have an asset that they will target. A vulnerability is just a flaw or a weakness that allows someone to bypass security. A threat vector is the means by which an attack can occur. A risk is going to uh, be a situation that involves exposure to some measure of danger. And again, remember we talked about security uh, trying to provide freedom from danger. Our risk response techniques are fourfold. Uh, it used to be three. We used to talk about what was called the, um, the ATM, uh, but now we've also inserted what's called avoidance. So we have accepting uh, a particular piece of information as a risk. Uh, we don't really take any steps to acknowledge it. So we just say, you know what, we're good. We're going to see what happens. If it, if it comes about, then obviously the loss is not significant enough for us to make uh, preparations or the risk is uh, very minimal or the loss is so astronomically unlikely. Transfer, which is trying to move risk to a third party. So this would be like car insurance, you know, trying to say, okay, if something happens, I've, uh, I've paid my premiums to Allstate or, or Geico or State Farm or whomever, and they're going to take care of the bulk of what's going on. So I pay a little bit over time so they can handle the big issue when it comes about. Avoidance. Uh, this is identifying a risk but making a decision not to engage in the activity. So this is a, um, a push beyond uh, transference and mitigation. This is saying there's a risk. It's too big for us to take on or the rewards for engaging in the activity are not worth the risk. And again, it's um, a lot of involvement of what's called a cost benefit analysis. Mitigation is an attempt to address risk by making it less serious. So, you know, again, if we go back to the whole car insurance thing, mitigation would then be wearing your seatbelt, not texting and driving, making sure that you have enough fuel so you don't break down on the side of the road by running out, making sure that your oil changes are done regularly, uh, maintaining your tires so that that way your systems are in the least possible likelihood of, uh, of spontaneous failure. So here we have a table that just kind of gives us the graphic uh, representation of what we had two slides ago, talking about things that could be stolen, vulnerabilities thereof, etc. Information security is helpful in preventing uh, data theft, thwarting identity theft, which can be um, usually built on data theft, avoiding the legal consequences of not securing information, there are many, maintaining productivity, of course, and then foiling cyber terrorism. Um, I always like to talk about cyber terrorism because there are situations in which the same activities can be carried out uh, by two different organizations and they will either be called hacktivism or cyber terrorism depending on what the, uh, the goal was. Uh, it's the same activities, they're both illegal, but the uh, intended result is often judged by those who survive the conflict or are the victors in the conflict rather um, to paint them in one capacity or other. So it's important to remember the victors write history uh, even in information security. Preventing a data uh, cache from being breached or a database from being uh, manipulated or otherwise damaged is often the primary objective of an organization's information security platform. Uh, so if we're dealing with a company like PPD or Verizon or whatever else, their databases are going to contain a lot of potentially sensitive information. So 
in an enterprise environment like I'm describing, their business information may be proprietary dealing with how they do business. If it's PPD, it could be things like uh, dealing with the results of, of clinical trials. But this will also contain usually an aggregate amount of information about individuals. So that's when it leads to personal data theft, like things like credit card numbers, uh, social security numbers, birthdays, medical history, things like that. Identity theft is a compounded form of data theft that deals with stealing another person's personal information to create a profile. That profile is often used for financial gain, though it can be used for uh, different types of, you know, psychological warfare, things of that nature. So steal a person's social security number, create a new credit card account, leave them unpaid, file fraudulent tax returns, um, funnel purchases the person may have made online by using a change of address form, um, you know, with the, with the credit card account, you could actually do that and use a change of address form to where all of the statements go to a P.O. box. A lot of credit cards in the modern environment, um, because of how millennials are changing their, their purchasing practices, um, they're trying to bring people in and say, OK, so there's no annual fee. We're going to start you off at this particular limit. And if you make, you know, five consecutive payments on time, then we will go ahead and increase your limit. And then you'll be up for a review in another six months or whatever else. Um, to try and get people to um, buy into the credit card industry a little bit more um, in order to keep them solvent. So once that's done, you know, somebody could theoretically create a new card, pay it up for a couple of months, um, even fraudulently. You know, they would say, okay, I'm going to go and put a couple of purchases on here. And the other person may see an actual increase in their credit score because there's uh, good behavior still going on, lowered available credit. So they don't necessarily see it as a bad thing they may conflate it with actions that they have been taking themselves. Um, then, once this is done and they get an increased limit on the on the new card under the false uh, pretense, then they can go ahead and go, you know, max it out and whatever else, and then they just leave it unpaid and walk. Um, and it may take months before uh, it becomes brought to the attention of the original individual, or it may never be brought up to the individual and they go for, you know, applying for a mortgage or something later on and figure out, hey, you've got like a $3,000 unpaid credit card charge to, um, you know, MasterCard or whomever else that was opened up in, you know, February of 2018. What's going on with that? And it's like, I've never seen that card before. Um, you know, the, the address on file they have is this you know, P.O. box and blah, blah, blah. That was put together with, you know, falsified credentials or, or, you know, fake ID, things like that. So it becomes very difficult to track and it becomes very difficult to fight. Um, now, thankfully, things like the, um, the FACTA Act of uh, 2003 or 4, uh, which allows you free access to your credit report once a year, um, has actually improved that for a lot of people. Now that the agencies basically say, if you can prove that this was a fraudulent charge and nobody was investigating it, then we can we can remove it from your score and you can um, work with your credit agency to make sure that this doesn't happen again in future. Legal consequences. Oh my my, so many legal consequences. Uh, HIPAA, probably the one best known, um, signed into law under President Clinton in 1996, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. This protects who has uh, availability to speak about your health information. So talking about, you know, conversations between your pharmacist, your doctor, your insurance company. Uh, if you're a minor, you know, your parent or guardian, that's all stuff that's in there. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, it was called Sarbox. Uh, that was signed under um, George Bush uh, II, um, George W. Bush. Uh, Graham, Bleach, uh, Glam, Graham Leach Bliley Act, the GLBA. Uh, payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, or PCI DSS. Um, something that was brought up in class the last time we did a face-to-face -face on this was that uh, there are a number of companies that they have legacy support for PCI DSS but haven't updated to certain new standards because, again, um, there is a, an attendant cost in making sure that all of your storage areas and all of your software is up to date. So they basically just implicitly uh, hope that people will not ask if they're PCI DSS compliant. I believe Target was the example we talked about at that time. I cannot substantiate that information at this time. Uh, I may have to do a little bit of extra research, see if I can find a documentation on that. Um, but there are a number of industries that have been found to um, have, you know, seven, eight, maybe nine of the 12 required components, maybe even all the way up to 11, and they just never pushed it to that last one. 
um, to make sure that they were in fact compliant. Um, usually you'll have what's called a GRC, which is a governance risk and um, control officer or compliance officer, I'm sorry, compliance, not control, uh, governance, risk, and compliance to make sure that everybody is uh, playing on correctly. And again, avoiding those legal consequences. You're not getting bit uh, on the ankle when somebody comes back and says, hey, you had a data breach or you had X, Y, or Z issue, and uh, I'm going to sue you because you didn't carry my payment card uh, according to PCI DSS standards. You know, you're non-compliant, so you are not advertising yourself. Uh, effectively as an agency and we need to make sure that we have that taken care of and those violations can be very very expensive state notification and security laws um, California's um, Security Breach Notification Act of 2003 this was one of the first data notification acts in the entire country um, California is largely leading the US in terms of consumer data protection um, on the books um, the UK is currently one of the bigger standards, you know, for GDPR protection, um, making sure that consumer data is being um, much more effectively processed. There's a lot more transparency and there's a lot more ability to opt out. Um, I believe there's a um, right, like a right to abstain or some kind of uh, there's some kind of article that's uh, attended to that to allow people to. Um, not take part in mass data minings and things like that and allowing their data to be excluded. Maintaining productivity. This one can be a little bit of a challenge. So here we have uh, a table that just shows us a couple of different metrics that we can use to identify what may happen in the event of an attack. So I'm going to look at line uh, number one with the 100 employees and line number four with 1,000 employees and do a little point for point comparison on how different it is. Now, if this were a linear scale, we would assume that it would take 10 times as many individuals to combat the attack. That tracks. That's fine. Uh, the number of hours required, we would say if there's 10 times as many people, it should take 10 times as amount uh, of time. So that would be if 48 hours is two days, then it would take um, 10 times as much or 20 days. And that's not great, but we can see here. Uh, it's only four days, so we're a little bit uh, in pocket on that. On the other hand, if we look over here at the salaries, we're only seeing a $5 per hour increase, but we're seeing 900 extra employees, so that averages a little bit differently. So instead of seeing what we would have expected to be about 40,000, about 41,000, just under, uh, we instead see almost a quarter of a million, 220,000, pretty significant. Instead of seeing 810 hours of lost productivity, as we see on the far right column, we instead see just shy of 1,300. So we see that this is much more of a, uh, a logarithmic scale, not quite exponential, but a, I would say a logarithmic scale. Um, as we go from 100 to 250 to 500, especially if we're looking under the lost salary uh, increments here, we see that the growth is really, really significant. And this is because the longer a company is down, depending on the depth of the attack, um, its business disruptions become more and more pronounced. And we see this, of course, in the time of COVID uh, as being represented by businesses unable to sustain more than a month or maybe a month and a half of disrupted productivity. Cyber terrorism. So again, uh, as I said a little bit earlier, we're gonna see a comparison here between cyber terrorism and hacktivism, uh, and we'll see how that differentiates. Cyber terrorism is a premeditated, politically motivated attack against information, computer systems, computer programs, and data. It is designed to cause panic, provoke violence, and result in financial catastrophe. Some primary targets that we might see would be things like the banking industry. Of course, you know, with everything going digital, um, I think it's what, seven out of every $10 that exists in the U.S. monetary system is non-physical, um, digital only. Military installations power plants, air traffic control centers, water systems. Um, power plants and water systems, of course, are very, very evident. You see what happens um, in coastal cities whenever we have a hurricane or if we're uh, in the Midwest, we have a lot of, uh, of tornadoes or other disruptive storms that might rip out um, you know, power poles, things like that. If we're dealing with water systems, look at places like Flint, Michigan, look at drought systems in California. Um, 
you know, contamination of groundwater by storm surge during hurricanes on the East Coast. So there's a number of different situations with very basic industries that we think about all the time, but don't necessarily think about what happens if they go away. What would you do if you went to the restroom, flushed the commode, and no water came out? What would you do if you tried to wash your hands and the pipes were dry? Um, you know, if you were thirsty and you had to go and find uh, water because there was an issue with trying to get clean water into an area. That is uh, unfortunately still a very strong reality for the people of Flint, Michigan and many other places. And even then, we realize that we in the U.S. are breathing very rare air indeed uh, because there are children in countries all over the world, you know, in places like uh, in India and uh, throughout places in Africa where they have to um, walk for miles to be able to retrieve water from rivers. They don't even have uh, necessarily a purification system or bottling or distribution system to help them maintain clean water. Um, so that's that's always something we want to be aware of is that um, we're really only one major disaster away from pretty significant chaos, which is why cyber terrorism is so terrifying. We just had that issue with the uh, the pipeline being hit with ransomware. Um, and, and that was, you know, it, it incited a panic without actually causing a shortage, which was the, the really crazy thing here in, here in the Carolinas, because um, we live in a port city. So we had gas coming in, um, you know, four million barrels at a time, and they had gas coming down the pipeline at like 2,500 to 5,000 barrels uh, being distributed to our area. So we were in zero danger of having a drop off in our gas income. Uh, on, on this side of the country, but um, up and down the pipeline, man, people were, were freaking out. And that's what happens, is it provokes panic. Uh, and that can result in financial catastrophe to where the governor has to step in and instantiate a, uh, um, an executive order, um, you know, state of emergency to prevent price gouging and things like that. A threat actor is a generic term for individuals who launch attacks against other users and their computers. Most of them are going after financial gain. Sometimes they'll get into uh, ideological gain, which we'll talk about with the hacktivists in a little bit. Financial cybercrime is often divided into categories depending on who the target is. Um, so individuals versus enterprises and government. Different types of threat actors can vary depending on what attributes they possess, you know, what their motivation is, whether they're internal or external to their target, and what type of resources they have available to them. Script kiddies, I, I hate the term, but I, I understand why they use it. These are individuals who do not have any primary knowledge to get this stuff done. They carry out hacking from purchasing these through websites or individuals. Over 40% of the attacks carried out in the last 15 years have been found to have little to no skill as the automated kit system starts to spread. Now, obviously the average was much, much lower as you get towards the early 2000s, but as time has gone on and personal computers have become better uh, and more available, then obviously that percentage starts to get buffered a little bit more. So we can see here from this pie chart, um, about 13% no skill, about 15% high skill. So those two ends of the extreme are pretty much balanced. Uh, making up about the same amount as the low skill chunk, so uh, 28 from uh, 13 to 15 here. Moderate skills taking up about 44%, um, as, as George Carlin would say, we are a nation of C students. So there's a lot of people that are kind of right in the middle. Um, so the high skill individuals are the ones that write the, the script kits and they pass those on down the line, uh, eventually making it down to the no skill people down here at the very bottom in light blue. Hacktivists. Okay, so now we're getting into it. Let's let's talk about it a little bit different. Uh, so rather than painting hacktivists as you know criminals with different motivation, let's look at the the true definition according to the text. Again, according to the text, they attack for ideological reasons that are generally not as well defined as cyber terrorists. So cyber terrorists may be you know trying to um, be much more destructive or, or much more involved in certain things. Uh, hacktivists tend to be a slightly more benign. Notice that I emphasize slightly, very, very strongly. Um, breaking into a website and changing its contents to make a statement. And then, of course, the um, if the hacktivists are exposed, if there are payments that are attached to uh, accounts that belong to them, people who are donating to their cause or things like that, a particular bank uh, may say, well, we're not going to facilitate you know, what we consider to be a form of domestic terrorism. Uh, so they say, well, fine, you're not going to process our payments, we're going to disable your website so nobody can go through you. 
Nation state actors, these are attackers commissioned by a national government to attack an enemy. Um, so this exists in the US, this exists in places like, you know, Korea and China, Russia, um, you know, Africa, South America, they're all over the place. And they're known for being very well resourced and very well trained. And the thing that is important to note is that with state actors, um, essentially the, the country will just disavow any knowledge of their actions. So if you look at something like Stuxnet, um, to where that's believed to be a cyber terrorist attack that's carried out uh, by the US and Israel against Iran to disable their nuclear program, um, you know, everybody's just like, yeah, we know it was you, but we can't, you know, obviously put proof on the ground of it. So what are we gonna do, right? So everybody just quietly kind of sits there and looks at one another and says, well, I guess we're just gonna have this happen. So nation state actors are very, very difficult to deal with. Um, the Sony hack that was done by the, uh, the Guardians of Peace um, around, who, I wanna say 2016, that was um, believed to be a Korean state actor um, operation that was carried out. APTs tend to be associated with nation state actors because these are multi-year intrusions that target highly sensitive uh, security information, be it economic, proprietary, or based on national security. The thing about APTs is that they usually require some kind of mole to be made uh, in the organization so that somebody can maintain um, connectivity to that, that internal source. Speaking of, insiders are believed to create over 58% of the breaches that exist uh, in most recorded attacks over at least the last 10 years. So these are employees, contractors, business partners, um, you know, let's say that there's a failed merger, things like that, you know, information that they may have access to, they can use to create an insider attack. A stock trader may conceal losses. Employees could be bribed or coerced into stealing data before moving to a new job if they know they have an upcoming termination, uh, things like that. Other types of threat actors we may see uh, would be things like competitors. Of course, this would be sabotage. Uh, organized crime, brokers, and then uh, there's a little bit of an extension of cyber terrorists, um, you know, talking about dealing with, you know, power systems and grids, um, again, causing disruption. So how do we defend against attacks? Well, we've got five fundamental principles, layering, limiting, diversity, security, and simplicity. <laughs> Some of these may seem like they're um, contradictory, but let's take a look at their descriptions and see what we can figure out. So layering means that we want to try and prevent a single defense mechanism from being the primary point of access. If we have multiple layers, it's gonna make it harder for an attacker to get through it unnoticed. This is often called defense in depth. Um, this can be useful in resisting a variety of attacks because as the attacker is trying to break through and they have to change their tactics, it is much more likely that an intrusion detection or prevention system is gonna pick up their activities. Limiting access to information reduces the threat against it by making sure that if somebody is disgruntled or otherwise uh, compromised, they do not have sole access to something. It's unlikely at least. So how do we limit access? We tend to use two different methods, technology-based limitations and procedural limitations. Technology-based would be things like file permissions from a uh, central domain controller or things like that. Procedural stuff is we can prohibit document removal from the premises. We can make sure that certain uh, types of physical materials have to be shredded rather than going in the standard trash, things like that. Now, diversity is very close to layering, but the idea is the layers must be different. So diversity, of course, being the inclusion of a number of different types uh, of information. If attackers penetrate one layer, the same techniques will not be successful in breaking through the other layers. So I, I talked about this a little bit earlier, the intrusion prevention system versus the intrusion detection system. A detection system will usually be um, what's called a bastion interface to where it provides um, a public interface of some kind. And then once the attack comes through, um, it will try and direct it to a honeypot or other uh, localized containment area inside of what's called a DMZ or demilitarized zone. The intrusion prevention system on the other side will essentially say we're going to cut off all exterior traffic which has not originated inside of this firewall so that we can maintain business as usual uh, unless we hear otherwise. Penetration goes through, um, you know, the attack is being monitored, they find that it's something that's potentially hazardous beyond its uh, ability to contain, cuts off the whole thing, and then all security is shut down until we can verify uh, where the point of compromise was. 
So this is where we breach one layer and do not collapse the whole system. Again, you get a splinter in your foot, you don't start going blind. Um, so use security products that are from different manufacturers. Use different hardware, different software. Uh, make sure that your groups who are responsible for regulating that access are different, uh, distributed. You see it in, uh, in a ton of different um, thriller movies and stuff to where in order to set off a uh, nuclear device or uh, bypass some kind of major security, two different people are required to turn two different keys at the same time, that sort of thing. Obscurity. This is trying to prevent details to outside individuals so that that way an attacker cannot immediately devise a methodology if the system details are obscured. So what type of computer they're using, what type of software, what type of operating system. So for example, if you're running you know, like an Apache web server, if they know what kind of version you have, there may be a particular vulnerability that they can use. If they know you're using Windows 8.1, they can try and run Metasploit to see if they can crack something getting into that. The nature of information security, of course, is complex. Now, complex systems um, are difficult to understand and difficult to troubleshoot. So that can be a problem because trusted users can sometimes be like, hey, I need access to this, this, and this. And it's like, all right, well, we'll, we'll create you know, a back door or some kind of access point for you, and we'll leave that there, and we'll, we'll hope that nobody finds it. A secure system should be simple from the inside but complex from the outside. So that can be very difficult to make sure uh, that we're implementing it correctly. So what we want is somebody who has no idea how to get in, no external credentials, uh, should not be able to get in, or if they can get in, get only into like public access areas. But somebody who is already inside, somebody who is secured, should be able to use prescribed means to access what they need. Now again, this is going to be an intersection of the convenience versus security. The more secure something is, the less convenient it likely is to use. So we have to make sure that we understand that simplicity and complexity are not synonymous with uh, weak security. Industry standard frameworks and reference architectures. These are going to provide a resource of how to create an environment that is uh, relatively secure. I always say relatively secure because there's no such thing as true security, right? This is going to give an overall program structure, repeatability, and guidance to be able to implement an effective program. Various frameworks and architectures are often specific to particular sectors, uh, industry-specific frameworks such as the financial industry. You may, uh, of course, see that you know with uh, with commerce of any kind, PCI DSS is one that's brought up a lot, making sure that people are compliant with that if they're working with um, digital payment cards such as your your credit card. While some frameworks are domestic, there are others that are considered to be globally used. So, of course, we always want to be aware of uh, what toes we are dipping uh, into which pools to make sure that we are following frameworks that are relevant to what we do. And that is chapter one. It has been an uh, interesting journey so far. Uh, we have another 14 chapters to go, so I will be back here with you next time for that. If you have any questions or concerns, you can always shoot me an email via my campus mail. Uh, you can always contact me via my Google Voice number, uh, which is posted on the syllabus page. If you have any other concerns or comments beyond that, just uh, drop by the office and say hello. I'm always glad to see you guys. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I will catch you next class.